me ask you this question. There's a phrase that's become very popular in the last couple of years for sure, and I want to see if maybe you're familiar with it. The phrase is cancel culture. You familiar with that phrase? All right. Uh, if you're not, I'm going to try to give it a definition uh, that I think is pretty fair. So it's a long definition, so bear with me. Uh, this is the way I'm trying to do this huge umbrella on this topic. So cancel culture is public judgment, shaming, or ostracization. That's a good Scrabble word, guys. It's got a Z in it. Uh, of a person simply because of a personal stance, private statement, political view, or politically incorrect, insensitive, or offensive speech. Let me say that again. Cancel culture is public judgment, shaming, or ostracization. That's a hard word to say for me. Of a person simply because of a personal stance, private statement, political view, or politically incorrect, insensitive, or offensive speech. There's a lot there, and that's part of the problem. So there's two issues that I want to mention on the outset with this, and then we'll talk about why we're talking about cancel culture. There's two main problems or dangers with this mindset. First of all, it's extremely inconsistent. Let me give you some, some reasons why that might be true. So a lot of times what you'll see, especially with celebrity culture, is a person who tweeted something eight years ago, they look back on their Twitter history and find this statement that they deemed offensive, and now in current time they cancel that celebrity. So it might be a view they don't have anymore. Yet now when they don't have it anymore, but they had it eight years ago, they're canceled. Here's, this is why I'm so glad that the Internet wasn't, well, it was around when I was a teenager, but it, social media was not around when I was a teenager. I'm so glad because I could, I've said some really stupid things as a 15-year-old that now kids type and tweet and put on the Internet for the rest of time. So there you go. That, that was just free information there for you. I'm, I'm just really glad that, that I'm not, I wasn't online. Uh, I wasn't on Facebook or Twitter when I was 15. Let's just say that. But it's inconsistent. A, per, a view that a person maybe doesn't have anymore, they're canceled for that previous view. It doesn't make any sense. Here, another way it's inconsistent is you'll see multiple people make a very similar statement, yet based on maybe their political leanings, only one group of those people will be canceled. You're, that, that happens quite a bit. It's inconsistent. Then there's always the question is, what is actually offensive speech? Who, who's it offensive to? Who was offended? Were they really offended? Or are they just trying to make trouble? And that's the second problem, the second issue with cancel culture, is it's really mean-spirited by nature. At, at the heart of cancel culture is, I don't just want to correct something that they said that was offensive or call them out for something that was actually bad. I want to destroy their reputation in the process. I want to ruin their livelihood if possible. I want to destroy their career path, right? They can't get hired for this job anymore because they're canceled, because they said this thing that I didn't like, that I can't really prove is universally offensive, but I didn't like it, and so they're canceled. So it's, it's, it's dangerous because it's mean-spirited. And even when people try to apologize, here's the funny thing that I, you see this over and over and over. When someone is canceled, especially if they're a public person, they'll try to apologize, and they make it worse. Because then they make it, I didn't really, I, I, I did mean to say that, but I didn't mean to say it where you would hear me say it, and I'm sorry that I got caught saying it, and so I'm going to grovel and look like a terrible person on my hands and knees, and they still don't accept the apology anyway. So you look worse for trying to apologize, even if you didn't mean it, than if you would have just left it alone, because you're canceled anyway. So it's messy, it's inconsistent, but it's a huge problem in our modern culture. So the reason that we're talking about this today, or we opened this today, is we're starting a new series today called Lost Art. And what we're going to do in this series is look at what we're going to call timeless virtues or classical virtues. So these are character traits that used to be normal in society. These are personal ways of living that used to be celebrated by people, used to be very valuable and important. But what we're seeing in our current culture is these same virtues are not valued at all. They're, in fact, in many, time, in many ways looked down upon. They're, they're like belittled. Well, we, no, people used to live that way, but not anymore. We've advanced beyond living that way. Or it's within a certain box that I don't approve of, so I'm going to throw all this out. So we're seeing the negative effects of not living up to these timeless virtues. So we're going to try to recapture those virtues the next few weeks uh, in this series, Lost Art. We're going to look at the lost art of these timeless virtues. And we're going to start today with the virtue of honor. So that's why we talked about start out with cancel culture, because cancel culture is so pervasive because our culture doesn't value honor, right? We want to destroy this person's career for what they said 10 years ago. We want to see them try to grovel 
and repent of their social sin, that they've offended everyone on this political issue or this personal stance or even this private statement that got screenshotted and went public, right? That happens too. And so we don't value honoring people. And so we're going to try to reverse that trend uh, and try to show the value of honor both this week and next week. It's going to be a two-parter. So there are, we're going to talk about four relationship areas in which the Scripture shows us why and how to show honor. And I didn't have time for all four, so we're doing two this week and two next week. So it was Thursday afternoon, and I'm looking over my stuff, and I'm like, this is not, if I literally want to go till seven o'clock when the game starts, I'd have plenty of time, but I don't, no one wants me to do that, and so we're going to cut it in half. So we'll talk about two relationships in which the scriptures say to show honor, how and why to do that, and then two next week. First, I want to look at a time when Jesus was canceled. I want to start there and say, show you that this is not a new trend. This is not a new phenomenon. Jesus, and we know he was murdered, you know, so we know ultimately he, they tried to cancel him, even though he, he's uncancelable, you know. But in his public life and ministry, many times, we're going to look at one example in Mark chapter 6, Jesus was attempted, they, they tried to cancel him. And the people that try to cancel him might surprise you. So this is Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. So it says, Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. You think that's a safe place for him, right? Wrong. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue of his hometown, and many who heard him were amazed, not in a good way. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Then they scoffed, he's just a carpenter. The son of Mary and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Then Jesus told them, A prophet is honored everywhere except his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. So, Jesus goes to a place that should be a safe space for him, and he's canceled by his own hometown people. They see he's been gone for a while, and he comes back doing the same thing he was doing, but the people, they they remember him as, oh, cute little Jesus who was Mary and Joseph's carpenter's son, you know, the apprentice carpenter in Nazareth, and he was going to maybe own the family business after Joseph died, but now he's this big, bad rabbi preacher saying all these crazy, kooky things and doing all these weirdo miracles, and we're not sure how how that makes any sense. This, This seems like too much for us to take in. It says they were offended at him. Not that he was doing, again, he wasn't doing anything overtly offensive or universally offensive. They just didn't like what he was doing, so they took an offense, and they canceled him. They basically kicked him out of his own hometown. They said, how dare you, Jesus? Who do you think you are, Jesus? You're so offensive to me, Jesus. And people have been saying that about Jesus ever since. So he faced cancel culture, and cancel culture is, is rampant today. It's everywhere today. However, there is a better way So what I want to do this week and next week is, what if instead of cancel culture, what if we adopted honor culture? What if instead of saying, hey, this thing is awful and terrible and I'm going to, you know, whatever, even if it is bad, we'll talk about how this, it sounds, it can sound very black and white. We'll see how it's maybe a little bit messier than what it may appear, but we're going to work through that today. We're going to talk about this this culture of honor, again, in, in four distinct relational areas, two today and two next week. So the first area may seem a bit odd. You may think that I should be teaching this downstairs today. Uh, But the first area that we see honor mentioned uh, overtly in Scripture is with parents. So I'm going to start there, and then we'll work through it, and we'll spend most of our time on the second one today. But parents is is the first one. So Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother, then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So Again, you might think, shouldn't he be in kids' church teaching this lesson? Sure, if you want me to, I guess I can, you know, whatever. But this is one of the Ten Commandments, right? So this is given for everyone. This is not just for children. This is for all of us, and we'll talk about what that looks like here for just a few minutes. This is an important one. If if God says, hey, I'm going to give you like the top ten rules for you to follow for the rest of time, and he puts this one in there, then it's one that we should maybe pay attention to. So first, I do want to talk to maybe the parents in the room that have children at home or to the 
or to those who are in here who are children living at home. Here's why this is such an important thing. This idea of honoring parents is was what I would call a proving ground. So as parents of children, whatever age they are, if they're at home, under our roof, under our direct authority at all times, right? Here's the thing. We're, it's a proving ground. So what we're doing is we're trying to train them in this idea of honor in this relationship with us as parents so it will have benefits for the other relationships throughout the rest of their life. So we teach them what honor looks like, and you could say respect is sort of a, a similar vein in this relationship too. We're trying to teach them what that is and grow them in this honor culture in this relationship so they can go get a job and then keep that job, right? Right? So they can learn how to honor those that are over them who are telling them what to do even if they don't like it so they can keep that job and not, and not just throw a hissy fit on the floor like they sometimes do with small children because that will, they will lose their job that way, right? So we want to teach them honor in this relationship as a proving ground for what is yet to come. Uh, this, and even, even with teachers at school, if we can, you know, as we grow them in honor in this relationship, it'll even help them when they're kind of out of the line of sight, which is, I think, important. So it's a proving ground for sure. However... Honoring our parents doesn't just uh, stop when we leave the house, right? I think we know that. So it's it's also perpetual. And this is, I think, more seen in the ancient Jewish culture than we even see it now. But we don't cease honoring our parents uh, just because we're old enough and we're adults. And I can do what I want, and you can't tell me what to do. It's not like we're having those conversations with our parents as adults. However, we do continue to show honor to our parents even as we are adults, I think one way we do that is still by seeking their advice or counsel on certain things. I think it shows honor to those that have come before us by saying, hey, I'm stuck here on this situation. What would you do? Or what did you do? That shows honor to them. It shows, hey, I understand that you may still know more than me, even though when I was 12 and from then on I said I knew more than you. As we grow older, I think we realize that's not the case most of the time. So I think it shows honor to say, hey, what, what should I do here? How would you advise me? Uh, It doesn't mean that you have to do what they say, but it shows honor, I think especially because you don't have to do what they say, when you still try to see what they have to say. Another way that we can honor our parents, especially as they get older, is to care for them as they age. This will look different in different situations or circumstances, but just abandoning them is, is not showing honor. So it may, maybe you do take them in when they are older and can't take care of themselves. Maybe you do finance certain things for them. You know, like, you know, it's like they paid for everything for me from when I was born to whenever. So maybe I can return the favor when they have some sort of a, a need or a crisis. So that's part of even in, in our older age, in our parents' older age, honoring them. And here's what I will say about this relationship with parents and children, especially as we're older and our parents are older. I know that for some of us in the room, uh, that's a complicated relationship. So it's not just like, yeah, mom and dad and kids, lovey-dovey, we're great till the end, guys. It's like, no, I understand that parents are fallen, broken, sinful people. All of them are. Some of them are way more broken than others. I get that. And so you're like, I'm not going to take them into my home. We just don't have that kind of relationship. So then how is that dishonorable to them to to say no to this or or to distance myself? And I would say no. In fact, for some people, honoring your parents might mean maintaining that distance from them. It might mean setting up certain boundaries because if we get too close, we know the claws come out. And that's never a good thing. And so for the sake of honor, for the sake of salvaging whatever relationship there may be left, there may have to be some distance set up. And you might say on the surface that sounds dishonoring, but it's not. If it's done in in this, I'm just going to stiff arm you forever because I hate you, maybe we're on the dishonoring territory there. And we have, and again, we're, okay, parents are fallen broken. I'm fallen and broken. We're all fallen and broken and sinful people. So there are going to be times where we don't get this right. So I kind of struggled with this this week about, man, I'm kind of feel like I'm setting the bar really high on honor here, and it's just impossible. And it is, and so we have to do the best we can with this. It is not always easy, and I admit that. I understand that. So sometimes honoring our parents uh, in that way is keeping that distance. And here's another thing. I think one way that we can honor them, especially if, if we've been at odds with them, is by being careful what we say about them, especially to our children. Right? I think that's a big way to honor them. I don't have to let the, the, my kids know every dirty little secret about my parent. 
I don't have to let them know everything they've ever said or done that I disagree with. That's honoring them. It's protecting my kids, first of all, yes. It's also honoring my parents or step-parents or whoever it is that's, that's that authority figure in our lives. That's a way to honor them is to maybe, be, maybe uh, keep those negative things in here, all right? Here, here's the other thing I'll mention about this, then we'll get to the second one. So it is a proving ground for younger kids, but it is perpetual as we grow older. And here's the third part that we see directly in Exodus 20 is there's a promise involved. I don't know if, don't know if you, you knew that or caught that, but I'll read this again. Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and mother. That's the command. Here's the promise. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Now, I'll be honest. I don't know how that works because I know people that died young and honored their parents. I don't know how that, what that means or how that works. Is that part when he says the... To you, the land that God is giving you, does he, is that part just for the ancient Jewish people? Maybe. I don't know. There's not really a lot of evidence to show one way or the other what that looks like. I'm just going to say if that promise is there, I'd like that. And so I want to do the first part of that by honoring parents. So I, I, again, I don't know how that works, but I do know it's the only of the Ten Commandments with a promise. And so I, I'm going to try to grab a hold of that as much as I can by obeying the actual command. So that's this idea of honoring our parents, and that was kind of short and sweet because we're going to spend the rest of our time on the second relationship, if you will, relational circle of honor, and that is leaders. Let me read this verse. This has become a very, very uh, hot-button issue, especially in the last couple of year, year and a half here. Romans 13, verse 7, Paul says this about honoring leaders. He said, give to everyone what you owe them, pay your taxes and government fees, boo, you know, Throw the tomatoes at Paul right now, okay? Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. Again, this has become a very, very, very hot topic in the last year and a half during our pandemic. And I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna try to leave my personal views out of this if I can. Uh, so here we go. I'm gonna try to show honor. See what I did there? Uh, even in the message today, all right? So as Christians, we are directed, instructed, even I would say commanded here to honor leaders and those in authority, even governmental authority. But here's where that gets messy, and here's what we've seen the last year, year and a half, is honoring someone doesn't always mean agreeing with that person. Those are different things. It doesn't mean just because they say it that I have, oh yeah, absolutely, you're in charge. So the Bible says I have to listen to every little word you say and all that. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to flesh it out. But so we don't always have to agree in order to honor, but we always should disagree honorably. And again, that sounds like a very black and white statement, but it's not. And so we'll look at that here for a little bit this morning. So obviously, I may not like the policy of a certain leader. And there are many leaders that, that I don't agree with a lot of their policies, okay? Uh, I may not like all the laws from any form of any part of the government, right? Especially the paying the taxes part that Paul says specifically. Why do you have to put that in writing, Paul, you know? Now, I love, paying taxes is fine, but, you know, I get it. Uh, I may not like the decision or reasoning of certain politicians or leaders. Again, many of them I do not agree with a lot of big issues. Uh, I, and even when it comes down to a lower level, I may not like every rule from uh, the boss at work or my manager or my supervisor, okay? And that's okay. Again, on, we don't have to agree in order to honor, but we need to disagree honorably. And that's what we're going to look at here for a little bit. So the important part is how I disagree with them and how I voice that disagreement with them. It's either honorable or it's not. How we do that matters. So let me give you a couple more examples here. Uh, during an election season, it is not dishonoring to point out a candidate's policy position or voting record. It's actually part of the process. We should know who we're voting for based on what they've done previously, if they have done anything previously. So pointing out their voting record or their stance on issues is not dishonoring them. It's part of how our government works. Even during legislation, it's not dishonoring to petition your side of the issue. You know there's going to be a big vote on this issue that you're passionate about. It is not dishonoring to have the opposing view and then try to get signatures, right, for a certain reason, to block a certain law or to change a certain po politician's mind on, on an issue or to get this, to sway them to do what the people actually want. That's not dishonoring them. That's actually how our government works, again. And even at certain times, here's the big one. Here's the big one, and you can disagree, and as I always say, it's okay, you can be wrong, but 
During certain times, it is not necessarily dishonoring to not comply with certain laws or rulings. That's been a big one even here lately. Let me give you some reasons why and then a few examples and then we'll, we'll move on. If the law is unjust in its design, it should not be, it, it is not mandatory that we follow that law. If it's unjust in its design, we'll give an example of that in a second. Or the other big thing, if the law is inconsistent in its enforcement to a large degree, I do not believe it would be biblically mandated that we follow that law. It would not be dishonoring to not comply with a certain law or ruling that's either unjust in its design or inconsistent in its enforcement. Let me give you, a, I've got four examples I'll mention, and they're all, they're all connected in a certain way, but they're all distinct, okay? Let's start at the very beginning of our country, the American Revolution. That started with people saying, we are not going to obey the leader of the government. And it was like literally people died, you know, it was bloody, it was nasty, it was horrible, it was whatever, but here we are. And so there are some, there are a few of them, and they are wrong, but there are some who would say, well, we should never have re revolted. The, there, because there were a lot of men of faith, a lot of people of faith involved in the American Revolution. I don't know if you knew that, but there are. Now, they weren't perfect men, they weren't perfect people, but they were, I think, people of true faith. And they revolted in a bloody way, against the king of England. And so there are some people who would say they should never have done that. It was an unchristian thing to do. The American Revolution is an unchristian thing. And I would say, you're delusional. Like, that's a crazy thing to say. Now, you're welcome to that opinion, but I would, I would say that person is wrong, and I would mean that. It wouldn't be a joke. I would say that, that, is, a, that is incorrect to state that. But it, it, they would be somewhat consistent if they're going to say, we should never get involved in any conflict, in any war. There are people who have that view, and that's fine. Uh, but I would strongly disagree with that. And I think Scripture, again, there's nothing in there that would, that I think that would really promote that to the degree that they would promote it. So you have that there. Would that, would that be wrong? I would say not, and I think most people would say not. So here's the second one, maybe even as easier to talk about. The civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. That meant a lot of people disobeying the government because the law before 1964 was segregation is legal. And so when we're trying to fight this, so again, what I, I said was, if the law is unjust or inconsistently enforced, I don't think there's a mandate in Scripture to follow those laws. And that's a great example of that is the civil rights movement. Lots of people of faith involved in that movement. We know them very well. Lots of reverend doctor, whoever, right, involved in, this, in these movements. But, but aren't they dishonoring the law? Like they're breaking the law. They're fighting against the establishment. They're trying to, you know, buck against the government. That's wrong. That's dishonoring. And I would say, you can have that view if you want, and if you want to have segregation back, I want you to say that part out loud. That's what I want you to say out loud, because that's, that's what that means if you want to take that further out. So we have that example, too, where it's not dishonoring to go against a, a belief or a rule or a law necessarily. Let me give you one, another uh, historical example, then I'll give you one from Scripture. So another historical example, maybe this is the guy you've heard of, uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer, maybe you've heard of him. If not, you should look him up. Uh, he was a European pastor in the first part of the 20th century, and he was like, I mean, when you read uh, his, about his life, or you read stuff that he wrote, or you read sermons that he gave, it's just so convicting. Like, it's kind of like A.W. Tozer in our Wednesday night study. I mean, he's like, Christians, you need to wake up. And so he's over in Europe seeing what Adolf Hitler is starting to do, right, in the 1930s, and he's speaking out against Hitler, who, right, He's the duly elected chancellor of Germany, right? He is the government. And I know this is an extreme example, but it is. Because not only did he speak out against Adolf Hitler in the 30s, he was actually part of a very, very uh, powerful uh, plot to assassinate him. This mild-mannered European pastor of a church was part of a plot to literally assassinate the leader of a country. Now, you would, we would have no problem with offing Hitler, right? I don't think anybody's going to say, oh, that's too bad. He's dishonoring Hitler. I think that's the easy one. This is the shoe in. However, if we want to be firm and consistent in our stance that we always have to honor every authority for all of time, well, that would include Hitler. If, you want, if you're going to be consistent, be consistent. Uh, I don't talk to anybody in here probably, but that's what, I just had to say it out loud. I have to hear myself say it out loud. So he's part of this thing. You'd say, well, that's really dishonoring to try to kill someone. And you'd say, well, it's a little bit different. Let me give you one example from Scripture, and it's not a verse in Scripture, but it's this whole idea of the New Testament. So this phrase came about 
uh, after, right after the resurrection of Jesus and in the Gospels and the writings. This, this, and it seems very small to us today, but the phrase, Jesus is Lord. Okay, that's important. That is not an accidental statement. It's not just saying he's God. It is saying that, but they phrased it that way because at this time in the first and second century, they were under the rule of the Roman Empire. An empire has an emperor. He's also called the Caesar. So the way that you would greet everyone, you would say, Caesar is Lord. That's the greeting of the day for every person in the Roman Empire. That's, that's what you would declare all the time. Caesar is Lord. It is not an accident that the authors of the New Testament declare over and over and over and over and over, Jesus is Lord. It is a uh, politically subversive statement. It's a dagger in the side of the Roman Empire to say Jesus is Lord. It's not they say, I, I even think that the Caesar would be okay if they said Caesar and Jesus are Lord because they're a polytheistic society in ancient Rome. There are multiple gods. Caesar just thinks that he happens to be one of them. He thinks he is divine. He is a Lord. But they didn't say that. They didn't say, oh yeah, he's, Jesus is one of lo- the Lords. He is a Lord. No, they said they, they adopted the phrase from their culture about their government and turned it on its head and declared, no, Jesus is Lord. Now, you would, you, if you, again, if you want to be completely consistent on honor, you would say, well, that's dishonoring the Caesar. It's dishonoring the leadership to turn their slogan on its head against them, to kind of stick it to the man. It's not honoring them, but that's what they did. That was like an early church statement. Jesus is Lord. So I think that there's enough room, uh, enough wiggle room here to say this is, this is trickier than we might make it out to be. Simply because a person is in charge doesn't mean that we have to agree with or go along with everything they say or do in order to honor them. So how do we honor leaders in our lives? Whether it's political, whether it's at your job, whatever it is, those that are in authority, how do we honor them? So we'll look at, we'll look at five quick steps here as, as, we, as we do this kind of the second part here. Five steps on how to honor leaders. Because it's not always easy, and we'll see as we go through here how that's true. But five ways, I believe, in which Scripture shows us that we can honor leaders. So this is going to be really practical here for the next few minutes. The first thing might seem obvious, but it's important. The first thing we should do for our leaders is to pray for them. Pray for them. And it may seem obvious, but we probably don't always do it. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Paul writes, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peacefully, we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. So here's why I think this first one is so important. We are praying for our leaders. We are praying for them. However, I think the real power of this first step is it's more for us, the one doing the praying, than it is for the person we're praying for, especially if it's a leader or authority figure that we don't personally like or that we always disagree with. Or that we know maybe your job, they don't like me. They treat me terribly. I don't know why they pick on me, but they do. Right? Praying for them is as much for us as it is for them. Because what it does is it can soften our hearts. It can maybe calm our emotions. It can clear our head. It can recalibrate our spirit. And so maybe you don't know how to honor an authority figure, either in your life or in the government or whatever, Maybe you don't think you can honor that person or those people. The first way to try to work through that resistance is to pray for them. Pray for them. It sounds simple, but it can be a powerful thing that can really break down some barriers or walls in our own heart to then maybe show more honor to them. The second way to honor leaders in our lives, even if we don't like them or agree with them, is to look for the best in them. So they may have a bad track record, like at your job, your manager may be like the biggest jerk you've ever met, and you have to deal with them, and you have to kind of follow their rules, and you have to do what they say, and it kills you every day to know that I'm smarter than them, I'm better than them in every way, I can do their job with my eyes closed and my hands tied behind my back, but I'm under their authority, right? So we may, and we may be even the target of their ire. We may be, their mistakes that they make all the time may cost us because we have to clean it up, you know, for them. I know that happens, right? But 
we should want the best for them because we expect the best from them. So get, we, we have to see that. We have to look for the best in them. We have to sort of, maybe today's the day that they'll get their act together. Maybe today's the day that they'll stop giving me the stink eye, right? Maybe today's the day that they'll do what is obvious to everyone else that should be done at the stinking company, but they won't do it. Maybe that's today. So yes, what I'm saying is live your life in perpetual disappointment. Basically, that's the message. <laughs> but look for the best in them. So we should want the best for them because we expect the best from them. And we should want them to change and get better, right? That's why we complain about our bosses or managers because we, we want them to be better. So let's try to look for that. Let's try to do that, not just complain about how bad it is. Let's try to maybe envision uh, the ideal boss or the ideal manager or the ideal politician. Man, someone that kept their word, someone that did what they said they were going to do. Like, let's just maybe visualize that, and maybe one day it will materialize into reality. So let's just let's try to look for the best in our leaders. The third way to honor leaders is then to empathize with them. Empathize with them. Here's what I mean by that. It's kind of taking step two one step further. Try to see as much as we can fairly things from their perspective. So when it comes to your job, try to think about all the pressure that your boss may be under, all of the demands of their job. Plus, they have a personal life with other things going on. So we see a snapshot of their day, but we don't know what maybe happened on the way to work that caused them to be in the attitude that they were in. We don't know what their social life looks like that causes them to always be on edge all the time. So we want to try to see things from their perspective. Even, even about our political leaders, think about the pressure that they are under, the pe- all of the kinds of people they're trying to please, all the people always asking them for stuff, always needing to vote on this or do this legislation, or this is so important to me and I'm going to call my congressman and let them know how important this matter. And he's like, I've got a thousand other things on my schedule today. I can't take another phone call. I don't have room for another meeting. So th- consider, if we can, fairly, things from their perspective. And when possible, I think a way to honor our leaders through empathy is to verbalize that empathy. So maybe you do, maybe you do have to like, I, I got to have like a five-minute meeting with my supervisor because I'm, I'm about to quit. They're going to cause me to just, they're going to they're run off another great employee. So maybe what you want to do is set it up and not just start blah, 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 blah. Maybe you want to say, okay, listen, I know you're under a lot of pressure. I know that maybe the company's going through a difficult time. I know that our department's been understaffed. I know that. Like, we want to start, it's, you know, it's almost, if you want to look at it in a sly way, it's almost like buttering them up, right? Like I, but it really is, if we're doing it in the right way, it's I, I'm trying to understand where you're coming from. I really am. I'm trying to see things from your perspective because I see things for me when I'm not really the one responsible for the decisions that are being made around here. It's different. And that, but when you're the one that gets blamed, it's a totally different ballgame. So maybe trying to see things and verbalize that understanding might be helpful. So this is, now, and sometimes we hear these things, we're like, okay, I know that may, that may be the right thing to do, but I don't want to do that because I don't want to let them off the hook. Maybe you'd say, okay, it's not like this week they've been in a bad mood. It's like I've worked there for 17 years and I've never seen them smile. It's like they've been a jerk since the moment I got hired. I don't know if I, if I look funny or if I smell bad or what's going on, but they have it out for me. Or they are so inept. It's not just like this one project that they botched. It's like they don't know how to do their job. And maybe that's your reality. Maybe that's where you are. So we'd say, well, I don't want to empathize because it's going to let them off the hook. It's going to reward bad behavior or bad attitudes or bad actions or bad decisions. However, think about empathy in this way. Think about honor in this way. What if honoring a leader through empathy causes them to act more honorably themselves? Right? What if they have no one who has ever tried to empathize with them before? What if they just always know, man, my employees hate me? And maybe they're like, I don't know why. I'm trying to do a good job. I'm trying to enforce the rules like I'm supposed to. I'm middle management. I didn't, it's not my problem. It's not my fault, right? Uh, and so maybe they don't have anybody that's in their corner. And so maybe if you're the first one, if you're the one that comes to them in that way in honor, maybe it will open, really open their eyes to see things they didn't see before. Maybe it'll take blinders off of them that they didn't notice. I didn't realize that I had an attitude. I didn't realize I came across that way, and they really mean that. So what if our culture of honor can spread and cause those who are not acting honorably to begin acting honorably? Just something to consider. Maybe if our approach is different, it will cause others' approaches 
to change as well. And that can be done through empathy. Here's the fourth way to honor leaders. The fourth way is to try to see a distinction between the position and the person. And we talked about this a little bit uh, last fall in our series Church and State about politics and, and that sort of thing. We, we talk, but I'll touch on it really briefly here. Um, and I just kind of mentioned I got ahead of myself in my brain. But maybe, maybe your boss is middle management. And so they're like, okay, I didn't make the rule. I don't really like the rule, but I have to enforce the rule. And so what happens is we get angry at the person who's enforcing this stupid rule. Why do we have to follow? We, we can skip these two steps and we're just fine. They're like, nope, we're going by the book. Why? Because their job's on the line if something happens because they let us skip steps, right? I did that one time. Um, I worked at a Toyota plant. I probably told a story before. Uh, one summer, my, summer between my freshman and sophomore year of college, my dad worked, he just retired from a uh, Toyota manufacturing plant in Georgetown, Kentucky. So there was a, a and I was on the uh, body weld line that summer. So there was a station I was working at, and the, to go from basically tell this robot to do this thing and put this part here, you have to hit, slide your finger on this little keypad sort of thing to tell the robot to start, and then I'm going to go do this thing and hit the keypad, and the robot can start welding this thing too, okay? So at a certain time of day, at this certain uh, part in the plant, the sun came through a window way up tall, way up high, and it would shine right on the keypad where you'd slide your finger on. And so every time you would have to slide your finger and then do another step in order to do the same thing that I could just walk by, hit the thing, and keep going. It was, I'm like, this is slowing me down. So I talked to another guy who'd worked there for a long time, and he told me a way to get around that. He said, if you hit this switch over here, it'll override the thing that's hit the light, the sun's hitting it, and you'll be totally fine, no problem. So I did that for a while, and everything was fine until it wasn't fine. I skipped a step, and it wasn't my boss that told me to skip it either. If it were him, it'd be a different story, but it wasn't. So I hit the switch, and what happened was I put the wrong part in the wrong spot, and I didn't. T- I was just in a, in a zone, just trying to go as fast as I can, you know. And so I hit the thing, and I'm on this other part, and then all of a sudden these alarms start going off, and everything stops. And I, no one knew what happened yet. I didn't realize what had happened yet. And then I'm trying to figure out, okay, what happened? What's going on? You know, because things happen sometimes. So come to find out, I goofed up, right? I tried to skip a step that my boss would not have allowed me to skip, and, uh, and I messed it up. So I cost the company time and money, and it was just not good. And they, luckily, my excuse was, you're paying me like a third of what you're paying these other dudes because I'm a college kid, so shut up. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I really wanted to. And the, and the manager, who, he pulled me aside, and he was a jerk to me about this. And again, I was thinking, I'm a 19-year-old college kid. I'm doing this basically to give you more people for the summer. Well, I'm sorry, but it's fine. Shut up and stop being mean to me, you know. And I didn't say that because I didn't want to lose my job because there was like a $500 bonus for being at work every day, and that was like the last two weeks. So I thought, man, if I just tell him what I think, I'll feel better, but then I will lose out on... Uh, you know, that. And my dad worked there, so I thought, well, it's his reputation too. So anyway, here's the thing. So the bo- there may be steps that we think are stupid, but it may not be that the person right above us is making those rules, and yet we point the finger at them instead of s- the rule. So we have to be careful that we can see the difference between position and person. I wasn't going to say that, so now I'm totally lost on where I'm supposed to be. Um, oh, here's another one. Uh, let me get on the political side too, because I know this is where this has become a really hot-button topic lately politicians, right? Now, I know this is messy and gross and sticky, but they have to make deals. That's what politics is. I got to cut a deal. I don't like everything that's in this bill, but if I want to get what I want in there, I got to give him something, right? So sometimes, even the people that were like, this is so stupid, nah, you know, it's whatever. It's like, okay, I, maybe he's like, or she's like, I don't like this part either. Like, I, yeah, I get that. And Ultimately, we would like our, our leaders to be like, well, I'm not going to sign, I'm just not going to vote for the bill. But they do because they're cowards. I mean, because they're human, right? No, no, anyway. Anyway, it's true. It's true. Politics is messy. It's gross. It's, uh, it's icky. And the more that you learn about the inner workings of it, the more you're grossed out by it. I get that. Um, and so here's the thing. There may come a time, and there are, I think there are times that we've already discussed, where we do have to take a stand against a position and a person. There are times, like, you know, Hitler's a good example. Now, that's a big one. That's a, that's a large, you know, hurdle to cross, to get over. There are times where the position and the person must become against, it's sometimes. But it should be a last resort, is what I'm trying to say. Because typically, on a, on a day-to-day basis, we want to see the difference between the position and the person. Here's the last thing, and then we'll close with this. 
The last way, the fifth way to honor our leaders is, again, it kind of starts with us and ends with us. We want to check our hearts and watch our words. Matthew 12, 36 and 37, these are the words of Jesus, and he says, I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. So going full circle, this is why we start with prayer, because if I can get my heart right, I'll probably have a better check on my heart and a better control of my words. So if we start there, we could hopefully end here a lot better. Again, it's okay to disagree with leaders. It's okay to debate them even strongly, even forcefully, but it needs to be done honorably as much as we are able. So what that means, I think, on a day-to-day um, level is to, especially in the workplace, to avoid gossip, right? We want to do our best to talk directly to the person we have the issue with instead of about or around them. Again, not easy to do. I'm setting the bar high here, but we got to set it somewhere, so let's just aim high, right? This includes no name-calling, no labeling, you know, especially on social media with politicians, you know. Like, let's be careful of the memes that we share about what we're labeling this person. Like, let's be careful about how we, how we, uh, this person is evil. Well, they might be, but that's above my pay grade to determine if they're evil or not. I'm not on the throne up in heaven, so I'm just going to kind of, uh, you know, sometimes, again, Hitler, easy one, I get that, but still, not everyone is Hitler. So that's another thing, too. Oh, they're a Nazi because they have this political view. Like, wait a second. Wait a second. When they start throwing Jews in ovens, then we can call them a Nazi. Until then, let's just leave that label alone because it means something, okay? It doesn't mean what you think it means, going back to the princess bride. This also, as, as I finish up, this also includes, again, what we do digitally or online. So you can gossip through text or messenger. It doesn't have to be come out of your mouth. It can come from your thumbs, okay? It can do that. Uh, how we email, what we email, who we email, in the, in the heart in which we email something. That, that's included in this culture of honor, and especially on social media. And I'm talking to me, because social media is a great way for me to say really funny, pithy comments that are really dishonoring, okay? And I'm really good at that, and so I have to just basically, and I did this a couple weeks ago. I had this thing typed out, and it was, it was right. It was so good, and then I'm like, I'm just going to delete that. Like, yes, it's going to get a lot of likes, it's going to get some comments, it's going to get some traffic. I'm going to be right in what I'm saying, and I'm going to say it in a really clever way, but it's not going to be honoring to the person that I'm trying to disparage, right? It's just not good. So this is for me as much as it is for anyone, okay? Cancel culture is so prevalent, and it's nasty, and it's hateful, and it doesn't work. So instead, let's build an honor culture. Let's build an honor culture. So again, with the parent parental thing, with our kids, or with our young kids, let's build that in them. And so that then, then when they grow up, they honor us still, right? And as we grow up, we honor our parents still. And with our leaders, whether it's at your job or at, in, in society, in the political realm, again, it's okay to disagree. Some leaders are awful. They are not good leaders, maybe not great people. And some situations are murky. This is not always black and white, cut and dry. But at the end of the day, honor is always the goal. I can disagree honorably, I can behave honorably, I can even resist honorably, I can withstand honorably, I can argue honorably. And so here's where we'll pick it up next week with this idea. We'll pick it up here. A life that honors others honors God. That'll be kind of our theme for the next two relational circles in this topic of honor. A life that honors others honors God. So that's next week. So until then, let's build an honor culture in a cancel culture world.